Well, good morning uh, and possibly uh, good afternoon. I probably won't get uh, this done uh, this morning because I wanted to show uh, several things. Um, I want to take a look at a piece of kit that I've had for a, uh, quite a bit of time and it's been a great piece of uh, kit here. This is a uh, 651B test oscillator and uh, it basically produces a, a nice clean sine wave from uh, 10 hertz, which we can see here, all the way up to 10 megahertz. In fact, let's take a look at the, the sine wave that it's actually producing uh, here right now. And if we zoom in, you know, you can see that it's a, a very clean looking uh, sine wave. And in fact, if I just uh, give myself a little bit more room there, you can see it's a nice looking sine wave. And, and these items here are, are uh, Wien Bridge based um, test oscillators. So let's come back. Um, this is a Wien Bridge based uh, 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 item here. And uh, what I wanted to do t today was to go through some of the, uh, uh, the controls of it, take a look inside, uh, and then uh, do a little bit of uh, adjustments. Uh, I've been getting rid of uh, or rationalizing a bunch of the equipment that I have around here. Um, in the lab and I've been upgrading with some uh, um, uh, purchases that I, I've just made at auctions and so I'll be uh, uh, parting with uh, the 651B uh, uh, shortly to clear up some space but uh, I want to take a look at it before we, uh, we did that so what we have here is uh, uh, the front panel uh, and it's uh, fairly straightforward you have a uh, frequency dial which is attached to uh, basically an air capacitor inside the unit that uh, enables you to, to set the resonant frequency of the, the oscillator. You then have uh, a range control which sets uh, a bunch of uh, resistant capacitors to control uh, or to add the, the range aspect to that um, uh, uh, frequency that you set on your dial. You have a little vernier here that helps you get an accurate uh, uh, frequency value uh, and then uh, what you have is a RMS voltmeter uh, here and this will read out um, the RMS voltage that you're putting out uh, on uh, the various uh, outputs. Now very typically for uh, uh, the units at the time what uh, uh, these actual uh, RMS voltmeters are, uh, are done in are done in uh, three different scales the first is 0 to 1 and that will typically be when you set an output value in a 10 range or a power of 10 range, you know, 1.1, 1 .1, 0.01, uh, that sort of thing. Then you'll have a second range underneath them that's uh, scaled for a 3 number and you'll see that typically uh, when you go and select uh, uh, 3 volts for example, you'll read your voltage off that and then finally they'll typically have uh, a DBM value uh, set and that DBM value is related to a specific uh, um, output impedance on the, the device and here you can see that's an output impedance of, uh, of 50 ohms and so when I look at the 50 ohm signal here and I have that set for uh, 0 ohms what we should see if we go over to my uh, my oscilloscope here and uh, we look at uh, down at the bottom you'll see that uh, I'm reading about 2.23 volts uh, RMS now the you know if you do the math the zero dBm is about 2.236 so this is pretty accurate in terms of the the voltage that we're actually reading on uh, the meter so if we look and zoom in on the meter one of the things you can notice is that at this uh, let me get in there at this level uh, where we have it uh, uh, very low because we have a, a 10 hertz uh, signal. I'm getting a little bit of uh, vibration here on uh, the meter. So what's going on is clearly there's some um, uh, interference from the actual oscillator on the output uh, uh, circuit because you can see that the voltage uh, on the oscilloscope is staying pretty much rock solid at 2.23 and what I'm seeing on my um, uh, 53131A uh, frequency counter, which is what uh, uh, this wire here is connected to, is it's uh, been bang on uh, 9.9989 um, uh, uh, hertz for you know the last 20 odd minutes. So 
we're getting a very stable frequency out here down to the millihertz range and uh, uh, we're getting very stable output even if we're getting a little bit of, uh, uh, of uh, interference on that but if we start turning this up you'll start noticing that uh, that frequency interference starts to go away and you get a nice stable uh, value there so anyway let's zoom back out a little bit and I'll keep going through the controls now this is uh, again this RMS is fairly uh, standard and uh, this seemed to be something that they had uh, on quite a few of the instruments of this era where what they would have is a course value uh, control for you to get roughly where you wanted and then you would have a, a very you know fine grain control so if I wanted to set say minus 5 dB here you know I would get within you know sort of range there on that and then I could use the fine control to just get that last little bit of uh, of accuracy looking at the mirror to ensure that the parallax error on uh, the reading you know on, on my um, meter isn't there and I've got a great bang on minus 5 dB uh, value now it's not minus 5 dB per se what it is if we go and take a look now at the next part of this and this is let me just zoom in a little bit here so you can get a nice view of this this is actually the the attenuator and so what goes on here is you'll actually set um, the level of attenuation that is applied to the output value now I talked about how the meter had those three ranges the first range was uh, 10 the second range was 3 and the third range was dBm and so the first two ranges relate to the volts and millivolts here and they relate to this three volts being you know the bottom here so I would read the value off that 3 scale and if I went to 10 volts here what I'd now do is read that value off the 1 or the 10 the 0, the, the zero to 1 value off the top of the scale if I wanted to work in dBm what I would do is I would look at this interior number in here that said plus 20 and I know that into a 50 ohm load this is plus 20 dB and so now I can look at the bottom scale uh, on the meter and work it out in dBm so if we were to go in and select you know one volt here and uh, I was to go up to if we come back to the meter zoom back out a little bit you know and come into the meter a bit and then I was going and select uh, 0.5 volts there and just tune that in which is a little hard to do because I'm you know way behind the, the camera here and then if we switched over to you know my um, uh, oscilloscope here you'd see down at the bottom that we're about you know RMS value of about 520 odd uh, millivolts so we're getting very accurate uh, values on this at, at this uh, thing. and you'll see the frequency has increased because I'm now at uh, you know uh, 100 millivolt uh, yeah now at 100 uh, hertz if I step back down to 10 hertz you can see that we're getting slightly uh, uh, different values in terms of RMS but still you know getting roughly what is read off the, the items there so that's the basic operation of the device let's take a look inside okay so now this uh, we're taking a look down at the top of the unit so let's take the the top cover off we'll flip it over and we'll have a look at the bottom of it uh, just in a moment but uh, uh, the covers are held on just by uh, uh, two screws and I have that great uh, period uh, vinyl coating that uh, is on all of the, the HP gear and I love that just uh, the feel it's sort of a miss uh, that on their uh, modern gear that uh, you don't get that same sort of uh, sort of vinyl grippy feel of course the downside for that is that you get uh, um, the items also get gunky and uh, and difficult to clean anyway here we can see in the side of the top of the unit uh, we can see the the air capacitor uh, that exists that uh, is where we set the uh, capacitance for the uh, the frequency and this is the basically across the frequency range and then we have the RC network here that we can switch into and out of 
that will set uh, the specific multiplier that is then applied to the oscillator circuit which will be on the other side of the board here. At the back here we have the power supplies, filter caps, um, some power transistors and over here we have the output attenuator. Now the output attenuator is actually you know shielded and that's because this unit is very susceptible to electromagnetic interference so as the uh, you're working on the unit you really have to follow the instructions that uh, are given by the manual as to whether you close or open uh, lids or so on because having those lids open will affect how the oscillator works and what the output frequency and signal is and so here you can see that what they've done is they have the uh, the attenuator completely shielded from uh, uh, other parts of the unit and if you look uh, inside here you can see the little um, the little uh, gray part this is the the meter at the front and it's going down into the other side of the unit so let's take the unit yeah, unplug that just to make sure that I'm nice and safe uh, flip it over and we can see that uh, again it has these feet that are fairly familiar if you've seen some of the other units of this vintage you'd be uh, familiar with that so now I'm just going to take these uh, these couple screws off and we can slide this entire base plate off I believe I don't think I need to take the the, the feet off for that just dropped a screw there let me put that back in okay and so here we see the main operating part we see the main operating part of uh, uh, of the unit this is the air capacitor again now you can uh, if I tilt this up a little bit you can see in there and see the gearing that is actually used to take from the front uh, knob go through and uh, control that and if we look right in you can see there's, there's no actual geared connection between the vernier switch uh, the vernier dial and the, the dial at the front of the unit how it's done is through friction on the bottom of this dial here so that you can you know turn it based on the the friction setting so often what will happen in the older units is these things will get out of alignment and it'll jam up on the on the unit here and this has it when you get right down towards one end of the the value uh, you know and then ha get down to like near one you're gonna have um, a little bit of like jiggling of the vernier to get it to, to grip to be able to have that little that little movement this is the main uh, oscillator board in here and uh, you know one of the things I will tell you to do is to do all of the um, um, all of the, the the adjustments utilizing this with this cover in place and you have to have this cover in place or otherwise it uh, um, the, it'll get uh, that interference and then uh, you won't get uh, uh, the right uh, uh, results you'll be trying to adjust putting everything back on and then you'll find it come out so uh, this is a this is an important thing here and if we take uh, uh, we can come in here and we can take this out there's only a couple of little screws here and have a look in under it And you know you've got uh, basically uh, a fairly standard board for the era. Uh, you know it's, a, it's going to be a, a single-sided load. It's uh, hand-typed little uh, uh, parts on it, and you have a bunch of uh, capacitors and then some tuning items here. Uh, I love the little heat sinks that they have on uh, uh, some of the transistors of the era. Uh, they look like little flowers inside the, the area there and uh, basically what uh, you'll do in here is, is you'll come in and you'll uh, if we have a look at the, the little plate again you know you'll utilize these uh, these pots here to go and adjust um, your know, distortion and DC voltage area and so on 
uh, and then you'll use these two little pots to adjust the 10 megacycle uh, flatness. This is uh, built before the, uh, the Hertz designation, so that it's referred to as megacycles. Um, one of the things that you'll notice, though, now this is a common failure mode, uh, and uh, let's see if we can get a, a, a zoom in on this. Uh, one of the things that, uh, let's see if we can get right in. Um, okay, so we've got that, so it's come out a little bit. One of the things that, uh, that you'll uh, uh, get often is, and this is how I bought this unit, uh, it was for parts not working, and uh, the reason it was parts not working was that um, uh, when you had it running at uh, one mega, in the one megahertz uh, range, it worked fine, but when you started putting it on the lower ranges, uh, I got no signal. And so the people that uh, I sent it to, that sold it to me, uh, didn't have any idea what was going on. But if you actually read the uh, the service guide or the, the theory, the uh, adjustment guide as part of the manual, what it will tell you is that this particular uh, item here, this uh, it's a JFET, I think it is, uh, or it might be a PFET, um, might be a, some form of FET. Um, I haven't had enough coffee yet this morning. The uh, uh, this is very susceptible. This actually, you know, can fail, and when it fails, what it will do is it will take out the lower ranges of um, uh, the system. And so, what ends up happening is that it'll work fine at the higher ranges, but from about 10 uh, kilohertz and below, you just won't get any signal. And so, if that's happening on your unit, you need to come in and look at Q1 here. I think it is. Um, let me just take a quick look at the uh, uh, the schematic and get back. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is Q1, it's A2Q1, and it's a PFET, um, and it says in the manual that, you know, if the lower four ranges aren't working, then it's most likely this guy is bad, so it must be a common uh, problem. This is used uh, to handle the impedance, ma uh, uh, impedance matching so that uh, when you're in the lower four ranges, you're not loading down the oscillator and then causing it to fail. Uh, this A1 board over here, let me zoom back out now. Uh, the A1 board over here is where you're getting all your power supplies. And so coming off the, the side here are basically all of the values that you need to track uh, to ensure that you're getting the correct power. And you can just hook up your uh, a meter to that and then start uh, adjusting the items here uh, to go and get the, uh, the things in correct, uh, correct voltage. You can see that this particular unit here has all of the original uh, the capacitors in it. Um, none of these are in bad shape. They seem to all be uh, pretty reasonable. Uh, if I was going to keep this for a long time, you'd want to take uh, uh, go in and look at recapping uh, these and um, uh, replacing all these electrolytes because they are uh, common to, to failure. And these guys here are particularly prone uh, to to going or losing value or connectivity, or losing you know the, the range or going to high capacitors, low capacitors, or going high ESR or, or so on. Um, so you would go through and, and, and try and replace uh, as many of these as you can. Um, what I found was a lot of the components in here, uh, and that PFAT was an example, they're simply not made uh, anymore. But if you follow through from the original values here, uh, you can go and find um, replacements for the original obsolete part and then find that they are obsolete and then find that the replacement for that part is going to be available somewhere. And there's actually an NTE, um, actually NTE have a lot of replacement parts that they utilize. And so you can just drop these in. And uh, I found that uh, this was a, an NTE part, I think it was a 179. I, I, memory's failing, I'd have to go look it up. Uh, but it actually was a, you know, pretty easy to go, as I said, like a dollar part, bought it from my local NTE distributor, dropped it in, and bam, the, the system came up and running. So that's uh, a look at uh, the insides of the unit. Um, what I'm going to go do in the next video is start to actually uh, uh, go through some of the adjustments. So hopefully you found this interesting, and uh, you'll tune into the next, uh, next video. Thanks very much. Catch you later. Bye.